my name is Anna Galkina and I work for a platform in London and I'm also part of the Switched on London campaign. I'm David Boyce. I'm Deputy General Secretary with Public Services International, which is the Global Trade Union Federation representing 20 million workers in 150 countries. Uh, my name is Dinga Sikwebu. I'm from the National Union of Metal Workers in South Africa, NUMSA. So I work for Platform London, based in London. My name is Mika Minia, and we've been focused on, well, initially the oil and gas industry since the mid-90s, and increasing also on energy as a whole on a wider basis. My name's Nick Dearden. I'm from Global Justice Now. Well, energy is the lifeblood of the global economy. Um, it's a very valuable commodity, um, but it's also something that should be a human right. And if we simply run it for profit, it's very difficult to use it to meet people's needs. And then you add into that equation the fact that we are the way we're producing energy is trashing the planet um, and destroying our environment. So if you take all those things together, it's pretty clear we need a massive transformation. If we're going to meet people's needs, protect our planet, um, we need to actually take it out of the hands of those who are simply trying to run it to make more money. Energy, oil and gas particularly, but also energy wider, is uh, a central part of the economy and shapes ultimately the social relations um, and material conditions and uh, democratic possibilities <coughs> in Britain, in Nigeria, in Egypt, in Alberta, in Canada. And we need to be challenging the role both of companies and of states in asserting control in repressive ways, in ways that close down possibilities for communities to organize, and also to ultimately build a better world and a different society. Could you run a hospital without energy? No, you can't. Uh, if you don't have the energy to pump the water through the purifying uh, plant and then pump it to the houses, you won't have water. Uh, if you don't have energy to light your streets, uh, they're unsafe. If you don't have energy to power your trams and your buses, you don't have public transport. So it's clear for all of our sectors, energy is key. Energy is key. But it's also key to our overall approach of building just and equitable societies, given that more than 50% of humanity lives in cities. Our cities are powered by electricity and other forms of energy. So it, it runs through everything we say, and it's the underpinning. It's one of the foundation stones of building just and equitable societies. So for me, energy democracy is a system whereby energy is used primarily for people's needs. Um, so you don't run it like we run it now, um, with the poorest people in our society paying proportionally the highest price, and of course our planet paying the highest price of all. Um, rather, you give priority to the needs of everybody. Everybody has the right to a certain amount of energy. You make it as renewable um, as possible, um, ultimately 100% uh, renewable. Um, and I think the only way you can really guarantee that is to give people control is to make it accountable, transparent, and actually democratic, to really put it into the hands of ordinary people. And where that's been tried through cooperatives or through innovative public systems, it's proved a really uh, positive, transformative way of, con of, of running our energy system in the world. Energy democracy is a, a concept in evolution. It's a, a concept that looks to get beyond this corporate, whether public or private, massive corporate financial uh, conglomerate that is really driving uh, the whole global economy. Uh, so it's looking not just at specific ways to have democratic control of energy, but it's looking at changing from the neoliberal market-driven way of organizing society, whether it's consumption, whether it's production, whether it's social relations, inequality. So again, because energy is one of the foundation stones of modern equitable society, the way it's organized also has to be equitable. So we see energy democracy particularly working in, in London as a crucial part of um, 
the ch of moving away from fossil fuels and of the climate transition. Partly what it offers is it offers a political recognition that um, switching from oil to renewables is not um, politics free. It's not value free. And that actually <coughs> the, the switch, as fossil fuels very much control, have a central part in our political system, but also we need to shift to an energy system which is ultimately around freedom, around justice, around um, uh, meeting people's social needs and allowing um, allowing communities to be empowered and not crushed. And energy democracy allows us to bring politics in to debate around what an energy transition should look like. That doesn't mean we can't do anything. That doesn't mean, you know, we should just go back to bed because it's too difficult, because people are actually right the way around the world, from London, where we're campaigning to set up a public energy company which will be democratically controlled by, by Londoners so that we can have a fairer, more renewable um, energy system in London, right the way around the world to, you know, Latin American countries, South Africa, um, India, where people are struggling to set up co-ops and so on that um, give people who don't even have any energy um, energy that is um, both fairly allocated um, and also you know not harming the planet I mean energy is a big issue for workers and ordinary people because energy is a key input into production Secondly, energy shapes uh, the lives of ordinary people in a big way. Without energy, there can be no production. Without energy, people cannot uh, live ordinary and meaningful lives. So energy is a key input in shaping what people can do, how they live. And uh, a lack of energy is uh, a form of uh, inequality. And in South Africa, where you've had a system of inequality, this extended to also access to energy. Historically, in South Africa, energy was produced to power mines, to power the sort of the big industries. And for many people, uh, they didn't have uh, access to energy. It's not an issue just for the energy unions. And this is what we've seen with the trade unions for energy democracy. We're bringing in health unions. We're bringing in unions that deal with the janitors, the cleaners of, of real estate. We're bringing in different sectors because the issue of energy cuts across all of our society and underpins it. So the energy unions need to feel not threatened, but they need to feel that together collectively and with social movements that we will create the political dynamic to protect them during the transition. That for us is fundamental. Look, I mean, uh, for ordinary people, the question of uh, uh, access to energy services is, is critical. Uh, for ordinary people, the question of uh, affordable uh, energy is, uh, is critical. The question of uh, energy that is sustainable uh, is, uh, is critical because for people, what's the point of having energy today and when you won't have it tomorrow? Traditionally, there was an idea that all you needed to do was elect the right government and let them get on with running energy in the public interest. Um, and I think people over the last 40 years have become much more distrustful of the state because they see the way that the state has colluded. Various governments of various shades have colluded with big business to take power out of our hands and to run our societies as, um, as commodities for profit. And uh, therefore, we need to approach this with uh, much more skepticism of the state. But that doesn't mean the state has no role. In fact, we absolutely need to use collective political power through the state in order to enable people to be able to provide on a scale that we need to provide energy. Um, but people can't let go. People can't just say, OK, we'll, we'll leave. we've taken it so far, we'll leave it to you now. They need to remain in the struggle. And I think co-ops, therefore, have a really important role to play as a way that people can come together collectively and say, no matter what the state does, we're going to try and do this ourselves. But ultimately, we see that we do need the power of the state in order to make this work across 
our society as a whole. So it's going to be a complex process of people engaging in politics and engaging in the political process, but at the same time uh, retaining a distance from that process. Um, so Switch on London is a campaign uh, for a democratically accountable, sustainable um, and uh, justice aware uh, public power company for London. And it came about um, as a result of uh, the kind of political shift that we see going on in the UK, where um, there's suddenly a new left emerging with the election of Jeremy Corbyn as uh, the leader of the Labour Party. And uh, there is a big movement for communities taking back, back their power in terms of um, people organising uh, energy cooperatives, but these are quite small local initiatives. We wanted to push something really big and really ambitious. The other um, uh, kind of origin of it is that uh, there are uh, tens of thousands of people in the UK living in fuel poverty and um, actually thousands of people dying every year from cold homes. And the tariffs that people pay for their energy are extremely unfair. They actually penalise those people who pay, um, who use the least energy. Uh, and we wanted to explore municipal energy as a way of addressing that systemic issue, both by uh, reversing the tariffs so that uh, the tariffs help out those people who are in fuel poverty, and also by um, helping people insulate their homes, um, helping people keep their homes warm because the housing stock is so um, so depleted and so so old and falling apart in in, uh, in England. Well, in Europe today, we're seeing something pretty interesting. Um, for a long time, political parties have uh, not interested a lot of activists because they feel uh, very isolated um, from from parties who, when they get into government, do exactly the same thing or nearly the same thing as the last government. We're now seeing a wave of anger in Europe um, as a result of the austerity that we've been forced to bear um, for the for the crimes of the banks and the elite. And uh, as a result of that, people have started forming new sorts of parties. Um, and we hope there'll be more democratic um, forms of parties. But, you know, Podemos and, and Syriza and the left bloc in Portugal. But also uh, in Britain now, um, we have a new leadership of the Labour Party, which uh, is much more in favour of things like uh, energy democracy. And I think what we need to do is that, but there's a vacuum. These parties have a vacuum of, of thought around things like energy because we've had a dominant economic paradigm for such a long time now, neoliberalism. So we want to help fill that vacuum. We want to make sure those parties, by working together, can actually come up with a way of running society which is both more fair and equal, um, but also less centralised, less dependent on the big state doing everything for us. Um, but, you know, I, I don't see that there's a better time to do that than now when so many people are disaffected with the institutions that run our society in the interests of a very few. Um, so we see uh, public municipal energy as something, um, as a way of addressing the challenges of scale in uh, energy democracy. So uh, there's a lot of optimism for uh, communities trying to take back their own power through um, small um, renewable installations, but that's tiny and the, the challenge uh, of decarbonising, the challenge of providing renewable energy uh, is huge. Um, so we see uh, municipal energy as something um, that can bridge that gap between the really massive challenge and the uh, kind of small scale de decentralised uh, responses. And we see um, London as one of the places that could um, implement that and we're really inspired by um, what's going on in Germany with uh, cities taking back their power and we hope that we can improve on that. And one challenge that we face is how do we, um, when we're pushing for progressive, let's say moving finance and we're pushing a public pension fund to take money out of fossil fuels, great, well done them, um, and then we're pushing them to put it somewhere else. And it's easy to say, put it in the low carbon transition, but that could be lots of things. So how do we get them to then put it into something which is actually public and democratic? Because the easy things to put it into are not. Like you can put it into a housing project which is low carbon, but actually it's probably gentrifying. Um, or you can put it into uh, 
an energy cooperative, but maybe that energy cooperative is ultimately mostly quite well-off middle-class people and it isn't redistributive. The challenge of how do we move finance and money, public money, out of fossil fuels and into something else that probably will be less profitable and also works in terms of energy solidarity on a global scale and doesn't replicate colonialism and expropriation, how do we do that? Yeah, so we've been, you know, in the past involved in trying to stop water being privatised and run as a, as a public good. And, and what that took was campaign organisations, NGOs, um, people of faith and trade unions, particularly working together to achieve that. And it also required a degree of international solidarity. I think energy is even more of a challenge than water because energy is so central to the way that the global economy works and global capitalism works. So therefore, it's gonna be, it's gonna mean even more organizations working together. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, we have a very powerful message. One important challenge that I would flag up is the challenge of going big enough and fast enough. Because, so for example, the uh, oil that's, um, that the UK is extracting from the North Sea, we have to stop within the next five years if we are really to meet um, the kind of 80% um, decarbonisation that's uh, kind of recommended by uh, climate experts. At the same time, this has to be democratic, there has to be a just uh, transition. So how do you combine these things? How do you shut down uh, fossil fuel infrastructure fast enough? But how do you do it in a way that is just to everybody working there? Who can really disagree with democracy? You know, people might not like it, but it's difficult to argue against what we're asking for, especially when, you know, you look at around the world at countries like Uruguay and Costa Rica, where they have nearly 100% renewable energy because of massive public investment. And if they can do it in countries where people, a lot of people were shut out of the energy system before, we can certainly do it where we have all of the infrastructure set up. We need to be able to think about what does energy beyond neoliberalism look like? We need to be able to articulate that and fight for that. If we're not explicit about saying we want an energy system that is beyond neoliberalism, then we're going to continue operating on the same playing field. Then we'll um, go for the easiest options. We'll go for what seems to uh, get investment. There's always a big question. How, do, how can we get investment for offshore wind? How can we get investment for these solar panels? And if we don't think well, what are actually the political structures that we are creating when we install those solar panels and when we source the investment, then we end up remaining in that neoliberal space. Margaret Thatcher had this uh, great phrase that she said, there is no alternative. And uh, unfortunately, people have really come to believe that. It's become a reality for generations of people that there is no alternative. Society can only ever be organized in this way. People can't see past the idea of the market and, and, and business. Well, we have to prove that it can be organized in a different way. You know, this, this period has been quite a short period historically. There are very, very different ways of organizing a society. Um, and our belief is that it should be organized as democratically as possible because when people are in control, they can make sure that power isn't simply um, used to create more inequality. Uh, so examples of different ways of organizing our resources, like energy democracy, like food sovereignty, are incredibly important in terms of convincing uh, younger people especially that things don't have to be like this, that if you get involved, you can make society different. And that's the most important idea in the world. I mean, you know, and however much I hate something, if I really don't think it's going to change, I'm not likely to try. Thank mm -hmm. you.